Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus. Thank you guys for joining us today for the 130th session of the webinar brought to you by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, and the Michigan Prevention Research Center. Whether you're by YouTube today or Facebook or you're tuning in live, we're really excited to have you with us today. You might have seen us uh, or seen my face before on the round table, but, but today I have the, the distinct pleasure of, of sort of filling in for the wonderful uh, Yvonne Lewis, who will be back next week, no worries. Um, I am the Community Assistant Dean of our Flint campus of the medical school that you guys might have seen our students in various settings. And I'm also a physician at McLaren, uh, just finished up seeing patients and I'm excited to talk to you guys today. So thanks so much for your time and attention. I wanna take a moment to thank our wonderful community partners. You can see them all there on the slide. We have so many people who've supported this work. You guys have all helped us bring trusted voices and credible messages to the community. So thank you so much for your work. Today, we've got some really special speakers today, including, doc including Dr. Susan Wolford, who's been here before, bringing us her expertise and her amazing medical moments. We've got today Dr. Amy Sachs kustak who's going to talk to us a little bit about how we keep our kids healthy through nutrition, which is awesome. And then we're going to talk to Dr. Paul Kilgore a little bit, who's going to talk to us a little bit about what's on everyone's mind, right? COVID boosters, and we'll bring in Ashley Herbig from the health department to talk to us a little bit about how and when we can get them in Genesee. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in if that's okay with everyone. And Dr. Kilgore is going to going to tell us a little about a little bit about his work with vaccines and what we should know about COVID boosters. Thanks so much, Dr. Kilgore, for being here. Thank you very much. It's great to be here with everyone. And uh, as always, these slides will be available for sharing and certainly um, want to make these available widely. So um, the information I'll talk about today is publicly available information, and you may hear it from other venues. So repetition is always a good thing. And uh, let's let's uh, move ahead to the next slide. Um, you know, one of the things that we learned early on in the pandemic uh, when we started to work on the vaccines for COVID-19 is that this virus has a very unique structure. One of the key structures you should know about is something called the spike protein. And what you can see here on the surface of the virus is the structure of the spike protein. It actually has several components, but the most important component is this area highlighted in the reddish color. The reddish colored areas are those areas of the virus and the spike protein that bind to your cell. So if the virus can recognize where to latch on to your cells, in your nose, your mouth, your throat, your lungs, and other places, that's how the virus is going to cause the infection. So our job with the vaccines is really to design a way to prevent that virus from binding. And the best way to do that is actually to create an antibody or a protein that fights the virus by binding to it first before the virus can bind to your cells and cause the infection. So uh, our work in Detroit and other places around the country, um, supported by NIH and the uh, program called BARDA or the federal agency called BARDA is one that actually has accelerated vaccine development. And we'll hear more about that in just a minute. Um, but these vaccine trials have been going on for quite a long time. We're still doing follow-up in our vaccine trials in Detroit. And as you can imagine, there will be new vaccines in the future for COVID-19. So that's something to kind of keep on your radar. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So this graphic is very important because it's pulled from the CDC data that's been most recently posted. And one of the things I wanted to draw your attention to is the change in the colored bars over time. So one of the things that you will quickly notice is that the reddish or the pink colors were quite predominant, quite common um, even as far back or as recent as June. And one of the things you can see now is that the number you see here, this darker green color, the BA5, and to a lesser extent, the BA4, have become more common. Um, it's really the BA5 and now to some extent the BA4.6 that are now circulating in our populations in the United States. One of the things that genomic surveillance is doing across the United States and in Michigan, for sure, 
is detecting these viruses and then telling us which of the strains are now circulating among our communities. And this is very important because it provides us with information about which viruses we need to vaccinate against. And that's why we do genomic or uh, viral surveillance. And you can see the numbers over on the right-hand side here. And then the percentage that you wanna look at is this percent total. And so clearly one of the things you can see is that the BA5 is the most predominant strain or subvariant, uh, it's an Omicron subvariant that we now have. And in contrast, the other ones have now faded away into the background. So next slide. One of the things that's very important to know is that COVID-19 over the time since the pandemic started has actually changed in how it presents clinically. So what that means is that back in 2020, say April or May, you may have had quite a severe disease that laid you low for a week or two or even more. One of the things that's now happened is that we have less severe symptoms and you see them listed here, fatigue, cough, headache, sore throat, run or, or runny nose, these are the predominant symptoms that we see with disease that's caused by the Omicron subvariants, the more, more recent strains that are now circulating. One of the things that's very interesting now about COVID-19 is that a lot of people may become infected, but they actually don't realize that they're infected because they don't really have dramatic symptoms or they have no symptoms at all. And one of the things that's so important to know is that when we go out in the community, it's good to be vigilant and know your surroundings, know who you're around and be thinking about those people that may have some illness around you. And keep in mind, one of the things that you may see is that they may have a very low grade illness. It may not even be an illness that has a fever. And you'll notice fever is not a symptom here in the more recent uh, strain uh, that's causing disease, the Omicron subvariant. So, that's a very important thing to take note of. And I'll come back to that in just a minute, but there have been many studies now showing that the disease is now less severe, which in some ways is good news, but there's another thing to keep in mind. We still have in the background of COVID-19, the possibility of long-term symptoms, uh, the so-called long COVID that could occur. And that's very hard to predict who's gonna get that and who isn't. I also have talked, uh, as recently as yesterday with individuals having long COVID. And one of the things to realize with this is that it can go on for a very long time and the fatigue can be very dramatic and indeed life-changing. So there's other symptoms with long COVID we can talk about later. Uh, next slide. So one of the interesting things about COVID-19 now is that when you go back in time to 2020, we all were talking about an incubation period of on average five days. And there was a range around that from, it could be shorter than five days, but upwards of seven or even 10 days. Now with the subvariants of Omicron, one of the things we're seeing is a much shorter incubation period. And that's happened progressively as the variants have evolved over time, the diseases have become less severe, but the virus has actually gotten much better at moving from one person to another. And I give an example here at the bottom where you can see, for example, if you had dinner with a friend on Saturday and then the next day um, they had some symptoms, they went ahead and did a rapid test at home and or they went to go get a PCR test and they came back positive. So that means you may have been exposed at dinner on Saturday. What does that mean for your incubation period? Well, it could mean that you just need about three, maybe four days for you to actually manifest symptoms or to become infected. So if you do get notified in a situation like this, that you were exposed to someone who is positive or has COVID-19, a good thing to do is around that incubation period of three to four days, just go ahead and do a rapid test if you have one. If you don't have one, then I would recommend getting uh, going into a... Uh, a local pharmacy or a clinic and go ahead and get that PCR test done uh, because then you can tell if you are infected as well and then you can take appropriate action depending on your, local, your personal situation. And next slide. Now, one of the things that we always like to do is kind of look ahead to the future. I don't know if you've heard the reports about the, the weather patterns and the El Nino or El Ninos and 
what's happening. But the Farmers Almanac is predicting a more severe winter this year compared with last year. So we expect more cold weather, more snow, um, more turbulence in the uh, weather system. So we also know in the wintertime, we're going to expect to have much more drier air. That happens every winter. It means that you're going to have much lower relative humidity indoors and outdoors. We know viruses like SARS, coronavirus 2, that cause COVID-19 really survive much better in dry air. Not only do they survive better and they live longer on surfaces, but they can transmit and move through the air much more efficiently in dry air because they don't have the water vapor in the air to pull them down and drag them out of the air where you might be breathing them. So not only does COVID-19 or the SARS coronavirus 2 survive better and transmit better in cold air and drier air, but other viruses do the same thing. So influenza likes dry air, RSV or respiratory syncytial virus does. And so keep in mind as you move forward into the winter, you're moving indoors because it's cold or you're working with colleagues, wearing a mask is something that you're gonna hear me say again later on in this talk. It's a good thing to consider if you're going to be in an environment where there's lots of people in a, in a meeting or in your work environment. Uh, next slide, please. I won't read all this, but I'm gonna leave it to you to have as a resource. The, the effects of dry air are really quite dramatic. It's one of the reasons why I would recommend you stay well hydrated, not only now, but as you move into the winter time, make sure you are drinking enough water and fluids to ensure that the hydration gets to your lungs, your airways, to keep them moist. We know we have these little hair-like structures called cilia in your airway. Those cilia actually help pull bugs and other stuff in your lungs upward and outward when you're coughing or when you're breathing. And they work better when your system is well hydrated. The other thing that's important is that when you dry out your mucous membranes in your nose or your mouth or your lungs, it actually gives a much better environment for viruses to bind and lock on to those cell receptors that I talked about earlier. We call them the ACE2 receptors. So that's what binds the SARS coronavirus 2 in your lungs and other tissue in your body. We also know that when we have the lower humidity, we're going to have these droplets that can spread through the air. And so just breathing, just breathing can actually expel virus, singing, coughing, anything that would expel air rapidly from your lungs, um, such as sneezing. These activities are great ways to spread the virus, and it could be for any virus, actually. So that's why I like to come back to that mask, and we can talk about that later, too. Uh, next slide. One of the things I want to also remind us about and remind myself is that we do now have three different vaccine designs in the United States. Uh, there's others around the country, but within the United States, we have three that are approved. The one, um, number one, you see protein-based, that would be your Novavax vaccine. That's the most recently approved vaccine. The second is a viral vector vaccine. That's the adenovirus vector vaccine. That's the J&J &J or Janssen vaccine. And then the third option, the mRNA vaccines, that's Pfizer and Moderna, are both of that design. And you can see here a little schematic here where the protein-based vaccines just take the spike protein. They actually concentrate it. Um, in the Novavax vaccine, they've actually paired it up with a special component, an adjuvant, that helps you get a good, strong immune response with the first and second doses. So that's a really um, unique approach. It's a very um, unique vaccine. We don't have another COVID-19 vaccine like that. So that's a great addition to our armamentarium and uh, fight against COVID-19. The middle one, which is number two here, the viral vector vaccine, that takes a spike protein gene inserted into an adenovirus genome. And then we take that adenovirus and we can actually put that into the vaccine. It's an innocuous vaccine, does not cause disease does not cause other harmful effects. And one of the things that we know is that it codes for production of the spike protein. One of the things that's important to know is that in order for you to create antibody against the SARS coronavirus 2 virus, you have to make antibody. First, you make IgM antibody, and then you make IgG antibody. And it's that IgG antibody 
that's the neutralizing antibody that you all get after the first and really get boosted with the second dose, the third dose, fourth dose, and even the newer bivalent vaccine we'll talk about. And the third, the mRNA, that codes also for the protein, the spike protein, in a very similar fashion to the adenovirus factor vaccine uh, from Janssen or Johnson Johnson. These mRNA vaccines are very efficient, uh, very uh, easy to produce and change. And that's one of the reasons why we have new options for the bivalent vaccine that I'll talk about in just a second. And the next slide. So what do we have available? We do have the mRNA vaccines, as I mentioned. Moderna's is called the spike vax. The Pfizer vaccine is called Comirnaty. And the protein-based vaccines, this protein subunit vaccine from Novavax, um, as I mentioned, it has an adjuvant. And then the adenovirus vector vaccine from Janssen or Johnson Johnson is another vaccine we've studied in the US and is shown to be effective and safe. So none of these vaccines, as you can see in my footnote here, are what we call live virus or live attenuate vaccines, uh, which means they can be safely given to a very broad population in the United States. We avoid live vaccines in pregnant women and other individuals who may have immunocompromised immune systems or transplants. But the vaccines that we have here are also um, safe for individuals who are immunocompromised. And I'll come back to that in just a second too. Uh, next slide. So the primary series of the COVID-19 vaccine is still very important. There are still many people, and perhaps you're one of them, who has not yet had a first or second dose. That's okay. Don't worry. You can still join the game and actually get protection through that primary series. So the recommendation that we have for COVID-19 vaccination, if you have never gotten a vaccine of, for COVID-19, is to start out with that primary series. That's a two-dose primary series. That's a monovalent vaccine. So it helps protect against the original strain. And that's very, very important because that original strain and the first strains that we saw with COVID-19 did cause severe disease. And if they were ever to come back, we'd want you to make sure that you have very strong antibody. The other thing to keep in mind is that these vaccines in general produce high levels of antibody, especially after dose two. So you want that second dose for sure in the primary series because one dose just doesn't give you a high enough antibody level. Um, now, keep in mind, and I'll probably repeat this again, if you haven't had the first or second dose, first and second dose in the primary series, um, you don't want to go for the bivalent booster yet. You want to get that baseline protection on board first, get that very high level antibody protection, and then come back a few months later and get the bivalent booster. And I have more information on that in just a second. So next slide. So this new booster that we're really talking about was just recently approved. Um, of course, it's been studied and given to people to make sure it's safe and effective. It's a bivalent vaccine. They are both mRNA vaccines. So Moderna has one, Pfizer has another. They both give the same protection against the same Omicron subvariants. So that's very important to keep in mind. One of the things that we know is that with the new circulating virus, and we look to the winter especially, starting literally now when it starts to get cooler, we know that people are gonna come indoors, you're gonna be in contact with people that are unvaccinated potentially, or maybe have not had a booster, their an an antibody levels may wane. So you wanna make sure your antibody levels are really up as high as they can be with this new booster. They were just approved, so that's really good news. It has the original strain from Wuhan in it, and it has the current predominant Omicron subvariant, which is the BA5 I mentioned earlier. Next slide. So who is eligible for these new boosters? Um, the two vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer have slightly different age requirements. Moderna is approved for 18 years and older. The Pfizer is approved for 12 years and older. There will be, and actually are additional studies going on right now as we speak for the younger age groups for the bivalent booster. Um, Moderna and Pfizer have been doing these. You would expect to see some new news on this in the next several weeks and coming months, hopefully before the winter really sets in. Um, you only need a single booster shot right now. This booster vaccine um, will give you full protection and will be really good 
um, and give you good antibody levels for this coming winter. And as I mentioned before, you're really not eligible yet to get that booster dose of the bivalent if you haven't had the primary series or the one dose from uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, in the primary series for Moderna and Pfizer, as you know, it's a two dose regimen. And next slide. What should you do if you have never had a COVID vaccine? Um, again, that is quite okay. Um, nothing to worry about. Step one, talk with your doctor. And this could be a family physician. It could be an internist, general internist. I would also recommend if you have a chance or it's easier to get to a pharmacy, talk with your local pharmacist about the new vaccines, about the primary dose series and uh, how you schedule a vaccine dose. And when you get to that meeting, go to the meeting and write down your questions and don't be shy about it. You could have a list of 10 questions if you want. That's very important in my view to be able to have that opportunity to get all the answers to the questions that you've had. And it doesn't matter who, who uh, is asking the question, it's very important to be able to do that. And uh, at the same time, you can schedule that second dose in the primary series. Next slide. And I know I'm gonna need to wrap up pretty quickly here, but I just wanted to mention um, a couple of quick things. S many people in our communities are immunocompromised. And the quick question here is, can I get the COVID-19 vaccine if I'm immunocompromised? Short answer is absolutely yes. In fact, if you are immunocompromised, I would say it's even more important to get that vaccine. One thing to know is that the primary series for someone who's immunocompromised is three doses of the vaccine. So three doses of Pfizer, and that's separated by a period of three weeks, you can see here. Um, and that third dose can be given four weeks after the second dose. There's a lot of detail here that I believe you can also read um, if you get the PowerPoint or also share. It's available also from the CDC website or uh, interim guidelines if you like. But it's important to know that both the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine um, are going to be in a three dose series for the primary series that you want to get. Now, one of the things also to note is that right now uh, for Novavax, a third dose in the primary series is not recommended at this time. I'm sure we're gonna see additional study data coming out in the next several months around this question, but for now uh, it's a two dose primary series with Novavax. And next slide, please. Um, if you're immunocompromised, can you get the booster? Short answer again is yes. Um, you'll wanna have a period of at least two months between the completion of your primary series, that three dose series or two dose in, in the case of Novavax and the booster dose. So as long as you have that two month interval, um, you're good to go with the vaccine booster. That would be the bivalent booster, okay? And next slide. I want to touch on one complication that's um, arisen with one of the vaccines. Um, it hasn't been very common, but it has been in the news. I just wanted to touch base with you on this briefly. Myocarditis and pericarditis are both types of inflammation of the heart. They affect different parts of the heart. The pericardium is that sac, a very thin sac running around the heart muscle itself. And that can become inflamed and fill up with fluid that compresses the heart and it doesn't beat so easily anymore. Um, myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle that you see in the lower image here. Uh, that can cause also abnormalities in the beating and the rhythm of the heart. And so that's something to kind of keep watch for. There are symptoms of these um, and they include fever, chest pain, shortness of breath, racing heart like palpitations, fainting, and sometimes sweating. The risk of this occurring with a vaccine has been small. It's been observed, so that's why I wanna mention it, um, but it's been particularly observed in males age 12 to 39. So what do you do if you are in that situation? Um, let's go to the next slide. One of the things that you can do is actually um, space out the intervals. Um, and one of the things that you probably already know is that the vaccines like Novavax and Pfizer are approved for a longer duration interval. So we can do three week intervals or four week intervals between the first and second dose, depending on your situation. Now the three or four week interval is recommended for most people. So that means immunocompromised, older adults and people where 
say you're in close contact, say you're at the checkout, you're working checkout at a grocery store, or you're a nurse, or you're working closely with other individuals in the community, that's when you want to uh, get that vaccine um, and the, complete the primary series with a three or four week interval. That's good for those folks. Now, if you are in a high risk group, that old, that group of males that I mentioned earlier, the younger males, they can actually space out the interval for the first and second dose of the primary series with no ill effects, no decrement in the immune response. And what that's found to do is actually decrease the risk of myocarditis and pericarditis. So that's good for those folks. That eight week interval can be applied for that special population. Okay, next slide. So uh, let's review. There certainly is a URL here you can take a look at. Um, and uh, for your reference, that's updated regularly. It's a great um, link to have, and it's a little bit hard to uh, remember. So I put it in the slide here for you. Uh, and then a couple more slides and we'll wrap up. Next slide. So I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna skip this, but I just wanna reinforce to you that this is for most, most folks, I'll call them uh, mo most of the population um, that you see here or you and me older adults are gonna fit into one of these schedules. So this is for younger people at the top, six months to four years, older children, five to 11, 12 years and older. You can see here, this is that three to eight week interval I mentioned to you in the primary series, okay? first two doses, and then the bivalent booster comes in at least two months after that second primary series dose. So that's the key thing to remember right there, I think. And next slide. Uh, this one is for immunocompromised folks. And again, what you're seeing here is the primary series really has three doses for Moderna and Pfizer. Um, the Novavax um, still, uh, you see here, is a primary series of two doses. But the key thing is you want to get that extra dose if you're immunocompromised because immunocompromised folks are not going to mount such a strong immune response from two doses in the primary series. And next slide. So let's get some action steps for you um, starting today. If you don't have one already, I would recommend that you go visit and meet your local pharmacist. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, it can be anyone, Walgreens, Walmart, Meyer, you name it. Um, they're all well-trained. I know because I train them also, and I know how much they know, and it's a lot. Um, if you don't have a primary care doc, I also recommend uh, you um, seek out a great family physician, and Dr. Edwards Johnson would be a, perhaps a great person to talk to you about that. And they are very important um, because you'll want to also kind of step up your game and make sure that you have all your regular checkups and your screenings done for the winter, get that all going. If you've not received any COVID-19 vaccine, again, that's okay. Now is a perfect time to start that primary series. If you have received one dose, schedule your second dose for sure. You want to get that primary series done. And if you have got the primary series done, you can go ahead and schedule your booster dose. The pharmacies have websites where you can schedule that online. You don't have to make a phone call. You can do it all online. It's very convenient now. And next slide. Now, I want to suggest that you make a note on your to-do list or your calendar. And when you meet your pharmacist or primary care doctor, plan also to talk with them about getting your influenza vaccine. One of the things that we know from the Australian experience, because it's just finishing winter in Australia, they've had a very severe flu season this year. What we see in Australia actually is a predictor of what can happen in the Northern Hemisphere, where we are. And so we worry now about a more severe flu season. So one of the things we wanna do is get that flu vaccine started as soon as possible. You can get it starting now. You can get it in October, whenever it's convenient, but I would recommend it, putting that on your calendar and making sure it's on your to-do list. And then finally, one of the things I wanted to mention is that if you are indoors or working close to people throughout the day, I do recommend wearing a mask. I prefer the N95 or KN95 mask because the virus is easy to spread. But if you do have a surgical type mask, you could wear that or other covering. And yes, Dr. Edwards Johnson has that beautiful mask there. Um, these are very important because they're gonna protect you against COVID-19, influenza, and RSV. 
And I just will end by telling you my recent experience. So um, my father is 92 now, and he just he had actually gotten four doses of the vaccine. He experienced COVID-19, and so I've been taking care of him and kind of bringing him meals and kind of managing him at home. And one of the things that I did um, throughout that illness with him is I was wearing a mask indoors, taking care of him. And I think it's very important to keep in mind that this virus is very smart. It's learned how to adapt to your body. It's learned how to attach to your receptors very quickly. It doesn't take many viruses now to cause the infection. So I actually tested multiple times um, after I'd been exposed initially to him. Um, and I did the antigen detection. I did finally do a PCR test too. Um, they all came back negative and I attributed that to two things. One is the vaccine, uh, vaccines, I had four doses. And the second is my wearing of a mask. And I believe um, great hand hygiene and just great um, clinical practices. You protect yourself, you can do it at home um, and you can take care of people who are sick around you and uh, you can protect yourself as well. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, look forward to any comments. I'll, I'll watch the chat as well. Thank you very much. Dr. Kibler, thank you so much. That was essential information and it was really just timely and, and what we needed to know. The flu shot particularly even is really an interesting and important thing for community members to know. I diagnosed my first case of flu a couple weeks ago, so we're seeing it in the community for sure. Um, and we're seeing vaccines at our local pharmacies. I, I took my my little kiddo to get her COVID shot and she was sad because she had to get her flu shot that day too. So <laughs> um, a couple questions from the community, if that's okay. Um, I think this is a really great question from Deborah Hardy. And that question is, if you had the primary dose series and one booster, should you get the second booster before getting the new bivalent booster? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Because the predominant strain that's circulating is this Omicron subvariant, the BA5, I would recommend going with the bivalent booster in this case. And the reason for that is very simple. You want to up your game and increase that IgG neutralizing antibody against the new strain. And that's exactly what the bivalent booster will do. So go for the bivalent booster. Thank you so much for that. And then one last question before we move on to telling you where you can get the booster. Lizzie Curlio, I apologize if I, I messed up your name, a community member question I received. Am I paraphrasing, and I'm paraphrasing for clarity, are there contraindications for not getting the new vaccine? Any medications I should tell my provider I'm taking before getting the vaccine? Well, I think the, the key thing is if you are taking any drug or therapeutic, or you're on an immunosuppressive therapy, um, it would be high dose steroids, prolonged steroids, um, other things like methotrexate, higher doses of that. Um, just let your pharmacist or doctor know um, that you are taking these and then they can discuss with you whether or not it's appropriate to get the vaccine at that time. Um, if you're a transplant patient, also let them know uh, that you may be uh, immunosuppressed because you're on uh, medications that will help suppress rejection of the transplant. Those are the kinds of situations I think are most important to let your doctor or pharmacist know. Um, in, in most cases, they will already have that in your record, but it's very important also to go ahead and mention it just to be sure. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for your wealth of information and the shout out to Primary Care and Family Docs. We appreciate you. You, All are, right. you guys are so important. Thank you very much. <laughs> As are you. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us to tell us about where we can get these boosters. Dr. Kilgore has told us so much about how we need to get our boosters and we need to think about our flu shot. I really appreciate you coming on to tell us where we can get them and where we can find them. Absolutely. As always, so, you know, thank you for having us. I speak for the Genesee County Health Department and partnered with Michigan United. As, right, as of right now, our three brick and mortar sites at Our Lady of Guadalupe, Central Church of the Nazarene, and Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church are all still up and running. No appointments are needed. They are all offering the bivalent vaccine. Um, I wish I could tell you how many times I've said, yes, we have the new one uh, within the past 24 hours. Um, we are still offering primary dose series. Uh, as far as our adults who may not have received the full primary series, as well as our pediatric patients or our littles. 
we do have three pop-up clinics coming up partnered with Michigan United. We have United Methodist Church. Um, we have an additional one that, sorry, the print is super small and I didn't memorize it. Um, and then we have the Davis and Farmer's Market. So these run respectively on Thursday, Friday, and Tuesday. Now keep in mind when you do look at our vaccine schedule on our website at gchd.us, you will see that there are times listed as well as age parameters. Please keep in mind that if you do have anybody under 12, you are going to want to visit a site that is not specified as um, 12 and up. So just be more mindful of that. We are offering home visits for individuals who do have barriers to accessing these sites um, for whatever reason, no questions asked. You can register for a home visit on our website again at gchd.us. All the same vaccines offered at our sites are offered to our home visits as well. We will come to you. We will make sure that you get your vaccine quickly, efficiently, and safely. If you have any barriers to navigating our website whatsoever, you are always welcome to call our COVID call center that is 810-344-4800. Um, we do ask that you leave this line open for those that are not able to navigate our, our website or access the internet. If you are able to do so, please do so. Um, we do have English and Spanish capabilities with our call center as well. That's fantastic. And, that's and then I know you have, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I know you have a drive through event that you wanted to talk about. Can you hear us? Oh. I can hear that. I, that? I don't. Oh, my. <laughs> my but apology. I do. So I'll just take <laughs> my one of <laughs> Um Hey, no problem. If Dr. Kilgore, I know he inspired me, but if he's inspired you to get your new booster, Cut, you can get it actually today, this afternoon, three to five, uh, I'm sorry, three to six at the Genesee Health Plan office. Our partner, uh, Genesee Community Health Center, and we'll be giving that new booster. We also will be giving out the flu vaccine. That's so important as we just discussed to get that. So you can actually get two for one here, the flu vaccine and the uh, and either the COVID vaccines, the third dose boosters, age 12 and up. And what's even better is that if you do those, I'll give you some free ice cream. So uh, I'd encourage you to come out today, a beautiful day, and you don't even have to get out of your car. You can just roll down your uh, window, roll down your sleeve, and a pharmacist will give you that uh, uh, vaccine So and booster. So uh, just uh, encourage everybody to come out. Jim, I'm holding you to that free ice cream. I'm All I'm right, <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to you personally. <laughs> It's good to know. Thank you. I definitely heard about the drive through event and thought that was an ideal uh, opportunity for me to get the booster. So I'm excited. Um, our next guest is is one of my favorite people. Rick Sadler is, is just a great resource in the Flint community. And we've talked a lot about boosters and what to do to protect ourselves. Um, it's also good to know sort of what the rates of COVID are like in the community. And Rick's going to tell us a little bit about that. Dr. Sadler? Sadler? Yeah, so uh, just a friendly reminder, we may not have brought this up in the last few weeks, but we do track, uh, well, the data we get from the health department tracks um, cases by race as well as uh, uh, probable cases. And so we wind up having flag cases that get registered as like being categorized at later dates. And so while when you look at the graphs overall, it looks like there was a decline in Genesee County and Flint. Uh, we don't have any lag cases for this week because there is no lag for this week. And so if you look at just the red, the bluish, the purple, and the turquoise colors, basically everything except the white, you do actually see an increase in cases in Genesee County. So we're going to have to keep an eye on that. Again, we always talk about trends. One week is not going to necessarily uh, dictate uh, some massive change, but that's something we're going to keep an eye on. And then in the city, we saw an increase in confirmed cases uh, from last week over to this week. And then we also saw a decrease in the positivity rate. So uh, again, this is kind of the same story we've had throughout the summer that uh, we've been in this state where uh, cases are quite a bit higher than when we did have um, our low, basically like the summer of 20, I'm trying to think later summer in 2021, when we still had some, um, uh, 
restrictions in place and we're at people were still uh, masking in public places and so forth. Um, so yeah, so cases are consistently higher, but not uh, spiking, I guess I should say. And then if when we look, when we break it down by municipality, we do this month to month as well to see if there's variations geographically. And this is kind of a, um, a, a narrative way to illustrate that. So for the month of August, the city of Flint was one of the higher um, case, uh, case count municipalities. But when you look at the spread um, across municipalities, it's difference between say maybe 600, 700 for a lot of them uh, and 1,000 or 1,100 uh, per 100,000. So the, the aggregate difference in those in the number of cases across municipalities is not massive. Uh, however, for the month of August, we do see those lowest cases in some of the more uh, far-flung kind of outlying municipalities like Atlas Township where Goodrich is and Clio and Montrose and Argentine out by um, west of Linden. So again, something we have to keep an eye on, especially now that Flint is uh, in the leaderboard, as it were, in terms of municipal municipalities. Cases. Rick, the thing that, the one quick question, I know we, I want to respect your time, you know, that increase in cases and decreased positivity rate, can you explain that to people? Because even I have to re-sort of orient myself to what that means. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if there's a decrease in positivity rate and an increase in cases, it just means that more people are getting tested and a smaller proportion of those people are testing positive. Uh, but I mean, it is a, a reasonable, um, it, it's a good reason to always try to keep in the back of your mind the uh, different contributions of looking at positivity rate, case counts, and, and case counts per hundred thousand or like case counts per capita, like percentage of people that are testing positive. Um, and then also uh, hospitalization rates because hospitalization rates are telling us how severe is that, um, you know, in a, in a hypothetical universe where COVID becomes less severe or were less severe, if we had tons of cases, but COVID truly was like something like the cold, then it wouldn't be as concerning. But we know that COVID is not like the cold, it's way, way, way worse. And so, especially in the first year of the pandemic, when we saw case rates going up, that was usually a pretty good indicator that bad stuff was going to happen. Yeah. Now that it seems like, you know, because of vaccine, um, uh, because of the fact that a lot of people are vaccinated, uh, many people have had COVID and there's some immunity, um, like because of the evolution of COVID, it's not seeming like it's quite as deadly anymore. Um, and so, pairing case counts with hospitalization rates and test positivity taken together, I think offers a fuller picture of um, what kind of trouble we're in. That's really helpful because Dr. Wolford is going to come on next and talk to us a little bit about what that means in terms of why we're still seeing COVID deaths and how COVID deaths are trending and, and how we think about that sort of data. So thank you so much, Rick. Really appreciate you. Cheers. Dr. Wolford, I really appreciate you talking to us a little bit about how we can understand what's happening with COVID and deaths. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. EJ, for this opportunity to share a little bit um, about on our medical moment this afternoon. So this week I've been a little bit reflective. Um, as some of you may be aware, I was born in England and um, grew up there and then came to the States for uh, college. And so when yesterday we got news um, of the passing of the Queen, it made me a little sad because, I mean, whether whatever one's thoughts are about royalty, she certainly served for a long time and saw a lot and took the country through um, some very... Uh, Ups, ups and downs and she was there through it all so as I thought about her death I thought about death in general and uh, specifically death as it relates to COVID um, and we know that we have seen differences over time and it sort of ebbed and flowed right so we had that first wave um, in 2020 the first couple of waves then a bigger wave in that winter of 2020 going into 2021 and we keep seeing and it keeps coming down but then it would go right back up and in winter of 2021 2022 we had these double waves of deaths um, and then now we see that it's going down again 
And we think to ourselves, well, is this sort of all gone? Is it a non-entity? Do we not need to worry about it? Well, clearly, I think from all the presentations that have gone before this, this morning, we should not think that um, we don't need to think about it. In fact, we do need to consider it quite a bit. And if we consider how many people are actually dying from COVID still, it's somewhere between 300 and 500 people dying every day in the US from COVID. And then we have over 3000 people dying every day globally from COVID. And we know that we're all connected, right? So that even if we happen to get the numbers to be very low here, but COVID is still circulating elsewhere, the likelihood of new variants occurring and then making it to our shores is sort of very high. And so, um, clearly, this is still something to worry about. And even if we ourselves may be at low risk, we don't want to put other people at risk so that they might come to harm and be amongst these numbers. Now, lest we think it's just adults, I do want to mention, because I know we're going to be hitting upon children in a bit, that even children die from COVID, right? And so as we mentioned before, that COVID was the fifth leading cause of death for infants one to four years of age, um, uh, and the fourth leading cause of death for children under one year of age. So certainly children are impacted as well. But who's mainly at risk? So if you go to the CDC website, there are lots of details about this, but there's just four areas that I want us to think about. Think about your age. So if one is advancing in age, like I am, you might be at greater risk, but particularly now if you're over 65 and particularly if you're in your 80s, then the risk goes up a whole lot more. So you want to be more careful. As has been mentioned, the immune system is something we have to consider. If your immune system is weaker because of many medication you're on, transplants, cancer, you need to realize that you're at increased risk and so take greater precautions. Sadly, race and ethnicity, and there are lots of reasons why this is, the social determinants of health, racism, et cetera, but just being a person of color makes it, you are at an increased risk. I am at an increased risk of dying from COVID. Um, and then chronic illness. And here's where I want to just take the slides down for a moment. I'm gonna stop sharing and you can spotlight myself and Dr. EJ if you like. We well, people need to know if you are at risk, right? So how many people know what their blood pressure is? It's so easy to know. Just, you can buy the whole monitors, you can get one in the shop, you just have to measure your blood pressure regularly, know what it is. People who have asthma, I do you know how, uh, any other chronic lung disease, do you know how well your lung is functioning? I have a little pulse oximeter here that's gonna tell me how well I'm oxygenating, but your phone can tell you that too. Certainly you should be following your symptoms and know what they are. And I'm gonna to get to one that many people don't want to think about. How many of you know your blood sugar, right? Those who maybe are aware that they may have diabetes know what I'm doing here. I am checking my blood just that easily to tell what my blood sugar is. And I can know within seconds, don't guess. All of us think that we're healthy. All of us think that we don't have any chronic illnesses or many of us think we don't have any chronic illnesses, but we need to actually know this. So monitor your illnesses if you have them. If you think you might be at risk, go to your doctor, get your blood sugar checked, get your blood pressure checked, know how your lungs are functioning, and then take extra precautions if in fact you are at increased risk. Thank you so much for all of that essential information. I was wondering how you were gonna work food into this, but you came with the very practical blood pressure cuff, the checking your glucose, that's amazing. Very good advice for our people listening. Thank you so, so much. Um, and, you know, Amy is actually taking over your food station, right? She's going to talk to us about fruit and vegetables with our kids. So I guess you had to go with something else. We appreciate you so much. Dr. Kustak, thank you so much for being here. I know you're going to talk to us a little bit about how we keep our kids healthy. One of the big questions I get in my office is, we're so worried about COVID, but what does prevention look like? How can I stay healthy? And I really appreciate you talking to us a lot about how we keep our kids healthy and your research and your endeavors in doing that. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm going to kind of go through this quickly because um, I, I think I said it, they thought, said I had 15 minutes. So I'm going to go quickly and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, mainly our nutrition programs through uh, the Michigan State University Hurley Children's Hospital Pediatric Public Health Initiative. This presentation is uh, loaded with pictures of adorable kids who have participated in our programs, both our cooking class as well as our um, fruit and vegetable prescription program. Um, okay, so very briefly, I'm gonna talk just very, very briefly about the Pedi Pediatric Public Health Initiative, which we refer to as PPHI, and then I'll talk a little bit more about nutrition programs through PPHI. So um, launched in January of 2016, uh, the point of PPHI and why we're here is to improve outcomes of Flint children and particularly children who are impacted by the water crisis. I'm not gonna go over this too much in depth, but just to have a general sense of where we sit within PPHI. So this is the organizational structure of PPHI. We're divided into five teams, child health and development team, the nutrition team, which is situated here, exposure assessment, health informatics, which uh, the Flint registry falls under, and child health policy and advocacy. So within our nutrition team, uh, we fortunately just hired a new faculty member registered dietitian who will focus much of her efforts on breastfeeding and um, infant nutrition. But most of what I do is really centered around these two programs that I'm gonna talk to you about. Um, so, so sort of why did we um, design these programs? Uh, initially, when I first I started with Michigan State with PPHI in 2016, but I'm a resident, um, just I live just outside of Flint, I've lived here most of my life. And when, when I started in 2016, I really wanted to talk to the folks who were on the ground, a lot of the dietitians who were working in clinics and working in public health and community sites. And what I heard over and over was that we are putting the cart before the horse. We have people sitting in front of us that are asking us what, you know, we're teaching them how, how they should eat and what they should eat, knowing very well that they don't have easy access to these foods. So, um, so really in August of 2015, um, Hurley Children's Center, which used to be located next to Hurley Hospital, um, relocated to the downtown Flint Farmers Market building. So Hurley Children's Center is situated here right above the Flint Farmers Market. Um, and, and about six months after that, introduced Michigan's first pediatric produce prescription program. The prescriptions look very much like, uh, like this photograph here. Uh, they're a paper prescription. So pediatricians essentially print these out after every visit and they give them to children and the idea initially was that these, the children would go downstairs and fill these prescriptions at the Flint Farmers Market, choosing the fruits and vegetables that, that they wanted. And the hope was that this would introduce families who might not otherwise go downstairs to the farmer's market. It, it would serve as an incentive to get them to the farmer's market. And ultimately, the hope was, was that we would increase purchase and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. So very briefly, um, this, is, this is kind of how it has looked over the years. So the program was introduced in February of 2016 with a small uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services Health Innovations Grant. It started as $5 prescriptions for every child six months and older at well visits only. In May of 2016, we received supplemental funding from Rite Aid Foundation to increase the dollar amount of the prescriptions to $10. But then we also introduced vendor prepared produce bags. So we partnered with vendors uh, downstairs at the market who would prepare $10 worth of fresh produce in a bag. And then on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, when the Flint Farmers Market was closed, these bags would really line the clinic floors. And then caregivers and families were offered the option of the prescription or the produce bags if they were challenged with transportation back to the market when the market was open. In November of 2016, these were $10 prescriptions given to every child, birth and older, at every clinic visit. I, I'm pointing out this study mainly because um, it is really the cornerstone of everything that I've done since I started. So about a year after the prescription program was introduced, we completed a qualitative study with uh, 32 caregivers who reported that they had redeemed at least one prescription. Now there's a number of findings from this study, but uh, the ones I'm gonna highlight today, I think are most important. Caregivers preferred choice. So they much preferred the prescriptions over uh, the, the vendor prepared produce bags and prescriptions were addressing food insecurity. This was something that we did not expect when we started the interviews. Um, and it was probably the major finding of the study. And then also at the very end of the, of the interviews, we asked caregivers if there was anything that we could do to help with nutrition and health for their children. We overwhelmingly heard from caregivers that they wanted 
uh, some sort of a cooking and nutrition course, class or course for their kids. So up in the upper uh, left-hand corner here, you'll see an orange. This is a, a representative quote. So we heard something like this from a number of caregivers, but this is a direct qu quote. I'd rather do the prescription. I find it easier to go and do my own shopping and let kids do their own shopping. So what we heard from caregivers was that although they much appreciated the produce bags, um, oftentimes the children wouldn't eat the produce that was in the bags and they never said they threw it out, but they often said they would give it to a neighbor or to a grandparent because the kids wouldn't eat them and they much preferred um, the, the, the prescription so that the kids could uh, choose their own fruits and vegetables. So shortly after that, we partnered with Flint Fresh, which was a mobile market at the time. It's now a mobile market food aggregation space and food hub. Um, so that children could leave the clinic with one prescription for $15 and then they could go onto the website or call and choose the fruits and vegetables that they wanted. Flint Fresh has a box delivery program so they can self-select the, or the fruits and vegetables that they want and Flint Fresh will deliver uh, the produce boxes to the home for free. Uh, we also heard very early on that um, folks were holding on to prescriptions. So at the time when we completed these interviews, they were $10 prescriptions. Uh, we heard over and over that uh, caregivers were holding on to them until they had $20, $30, $40, and were using the prescriptions as a way to feed their families when their food dollars ran short. Uh, we went back to our funders with this information and they allowed us to increase the, the prescription from $10 to $15, which works out really well because Flint Fresh has $15 and $30 produce boxes. So depending on the number of prescriptions that caregivers have, um, they can get a smaller box or a larger box. So right now the prescription program looks like this. So it's a $15 prescription redeemable at either the Flint Farmers Market or through Flint Fresh. And it's given to every child at every pediatric office visit. Um, in terms of culinary skills education, we also heard this. So um, caregivers told us that they really wanted a cooking class. We were here in this beautiful farmer's market, there's kitchen space, why don't we have a cooking class for the kids? So we introduced a program called Flint Kids Cook um, in October of 2017. This gentleman here with a white jacket, Sean Gartland, is my partner in this work. So uh, we've had the same foundation that has fund this, funded this program since October of 2016, and we've had nearly 400 kids that have gone through some version of this program. It's cook looks like this. It's a six week program. The first five weeks are centered around um, specific food groups. The children prepare two dishes that highlight a specific food group every week. The, a registered dietitian teaches the nutrition content and a chef teaches um, cooking to the kids. And then on week six, we call that kids choice. So the kids uh, look at the previous five weeks and develop uh, a meal for their family. So week six is really a family celebration um, to celebrate the kids and our, and our new chefs. Um, in May of 2018, we received our first large grant from Michigan Health Endowment Fund that allowed us to test the, really the reproducibility of the prescription program. So we knew that the program was working at Hurley, which was a pediatric clinic that's co-located with the farmer's market. We were interested to know whether or not we could take, the, take this exact model of prescription program and introduce it at another clinic, whether families would receive it. Um, we also heard that from, from parents over and over that there's many children who won't go to the farmer's market to take Flint Kids Cook as a class and we needed a second location. So this grant allowed us to expand both the prescription program and Flint Kids Cook. Um, the long and short of the, of the research that's come out of this is in terms of the prescription program, we are seeing really positive encouraging results in terms of child dietary patterns, particularly uh, with respect to intake of fruits and vegetables. We're also seeing um, very encouraging results related to child reported food security as well as um, household level food security. Uh, we received an NIH grant in September of 2020 to expand the prescription program to a third clinic, Matt Children's Health Center, which is our largest pediatric clinic in Flint. So the exciting thing, we, we're, this is part of a research study, but the exciting part of this is that we're really, um, we're really able to expand the reach of this program to so many children in Flint and Genesee County. Um, I'm gonna skip over that. Um, in the interest of time, I just wanted to share really quickly about Flint Kids Cook. So Flint Kids Cook is right now, we just, we just want, I'm gonna, I think I'm just gonna skip over some of this. I will, I do wanna say this. Um, we, we have some research around Flint Kids Cook, which I explained is the, is the cooking class. Um, and I think one of the most, one of the most 
really profound things that's come out of this is um, kids from baseline to exit. So over this six week period, we're seeing improvements in cooking attitudes and cooking skills, but we're also seeing improvements in health related quality of life. And both this larger scale, as well as physical, emotional, social, and school functioning scores. So we're seeing real improvements in kids' emotional health as a result of this cooking class, which is really exciting. Um, and as a result of COVID, uh, we Flint Kids Cook became Flint's, Flint Families Cook. So it is a virtual program that allows families to participate in really very much the same program, but uh, Flint Fresh delivers ingredient boxes and um, kids are able to participate in the program with their families. And we've had real success with this too. And, I, and that's it. <laughs> I feel like Thank I'm trying you so much. You you highlighted so much of the important stuff, and I I wish we had time to listen to you talk all day because I think it's such a great and important initiative. I love the idea that we're getting kids in the kitchen and the part about their emotional well being, right? They're taking ownership over their their food and the opportunity to take a part of take part in their health. So, thank you so much for your work and for talking to us today. Sure, sure, sure. Awesome. All right. Before we let you go, thank you so much for your time and attention. I just want to bring your attention to this very important uh, HFRCC research symposium. Please come join us September 30th, 930 to 3. I will be there. We're going to have some great people there. Come uh, and, and learn and, and be present with community. A reminder about how you can get uh, continuing credits for social workers is right here. If you have any questions, email uh, the email address on the slide. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. Please like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's been a pleasure moderating for you today, and I look forward to seeing Yvonne back. Thank you so much.